All right, thank you very much for having me. As Brian said, I am Mike Moyer. This is Mike Moyer's Super Awesome Presentation Zone program. How many of you uh, have taken dance lessons before? Good. This is a dance lesson today. We're going to learn how to dance. This is about steps like the moonwalk, like the electric boogie, like the, uh, the tango hustle, like the Charleston. These are a bunch of steps that you can put together in your own choreography to create a presentation that has a lot of sizzle to it. And like I said, people, when I coach teams with, with this pro program using these techniques, they consistently perform very well. I've been developing this program for in the na past uh, five or ten years to make it what it is today. And even today, I've made some tweaks to the, how it works, but um, mostly just to make it more clear. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So the first thing I want to talk about is room layout. Generally speaking, your room will look something like this. Now, this room does not look like that, but I'll adapt this presentation to fit this room. I designed this program for entrepreneurs pitching in a formal environment. And a formal environment is often a business plan competition at certain levels, a venture angel group, a, a venture capitalist who are more likely to have a conference table, um, but also angel investors that you might meet at a coffee shop or anything else. I try to get people to pitch this formally, stand up and pitch the room formally and arrange the room the way you want it. So this is a typical room layout for a uh, classroom, for an angel group or something like that. Usually chairs kind of in an auditorium setting. There's usually a podium where the computer goes. Uh, there's a presentation screen in the middle. If there's sometimes some rooms I've been in have big presentation screens on all three sides, I tell people to put the other ones up and use the one in the middle, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, and the judges and people who are important typically sort, sit towards the, uh, the front of the room in a presentation setting. They typically sit in the back of the room in a conference setting. So not everybody in your presentation is important. And that's important to remember because there's certain people you want to make sure you connect, connect with and there are other people in the room that you just want to make sure are excited about you. So when they're chit-chatting about it later on, they're going to talk about how excited you are and how passionate you are and how awesome this is going to be. If the room does not look the way you want it to look, you can come in and change the way it looks. You can ask people to move. Excuse me, can you move over to the side of the room, please? Or can you just move back just a little bit here? So I, you can move the room around. This morning I came in and I moved some chairs around. I pulled all the chairs out from out here, put a chair over there. I rearranged the room in a way that I saw fit. I had someone present in my class the other day, and there was a chair right here, and she kept bumping around the chair every time she walked past. Why didn't she just move the chair? <laughs> I've gone into a Starbucks and arranged the tables so I could have a standing meeting the way I wanted to. I've asked people to move seats so I could have more space. The other guests at Starbucks. Don't be afraid to own the room. This is about owning the room and being in charge of the room. That's why you stand up. As an entrepreneur, you're the inferior person. The far superior person is the one with all the money, right? The angel investor, the venture capitalist, they own you at that moment in time. So you stand up so you can own them for the amount of time it takes to convince them that you're worth investing in. A lot of times, people just try to do it informally. They kind of wing it. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. I've seen a lot of great ideas get crushed by horrible presentations. I see them all the time. And I'll I look at the business plan competitions and I think, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to yourself? So this is a room layout. There are three zones. This is why it's called the presentation zone program. The front of the room is called zone one. It's as close as you can get to the people that matter as possible. In this room, we have a conference table and it's along the sides here. Zone one is along the sides. And zone one goes all the way back, back to the back of the room where people that matter are. Here we have our organizers here. These may be the people that matter the most. So I should not be afraid to get close to them. That's zone one. Zone two is any side to side motion I can use. If there's any space in the place that I can go side to side, that's zone two. Here's zone two for me. Because I can walk all the way back and forth. This is side to side. This can be used to iterate points. It can be used to get excitement. It can be used to make the room more energetic. And zone three is right in front of my slides, as close as I can get to my slides, and it's okay to touch your slides. Don't be afraid of the slide board. This thing is not going to break. You're not going to get fingerprints on it unless you've just eaten a barbecue sandwich, which most people don't do during presentations, so you don't have to worry about that scenario. <laughs> zone one, zone two, and zone three. Zone th one is called the intimacy zone. This is where you want to be intimate with the guests that are important to you, the people that are important to you. Zone two is the excitement zone. It's where you want to get people pumped up for your idea and get them interested in what you're doing. 
And zone three is the information zone. It's when you, want, when you have information that's important, that's pertinent to, the information, to the, your business plan presentation, you want to make sure you communicate it to the right people. That's where zone three is. And there's certain things that happen in each one of these zones. For each zone, there are dance steps about how to govern eye contact. There are dance steps to how your arms should use, how your body should move. The tone of voice that you use, the position of your body in the room is important. And the content on the slides. Each zone has a very specific set of steps that make it work. If you're an awesome presenter, you don't need this. If you've had years and years and years of experience, you don't need this. If you haven't had years of experience, then you desperately need this. Because without it, you're going to give a boring presentation. How many people here um, ride horses or have ridden horses or been around horses? You guys know what weaving is or cribbing? Weaving is when a horse stands in a stall and goes back and forth and back and forth. They do it all day and it drives their owners crazy. They go to the vet and say, my horse has this nervous habit of going back and forth. And the vet says, well, that's what it is. Or they bite. It's called cribbing. They bite the edge of their stall and they bite it again and they bite it again and they bite it again all day long and it drives their owners crazy because it's boring to watch your horse. The problem the horse has is what? Right, nothing. There's nothing wrong with that horse. It's just boards what's moving around a little bit. But people were so sick of watching it that it drives them nuts. And the same thing happens in business plan presentations. People stand like this and they'll move back and forth on their hands and they'll kind of do this all the time and it's extremely boring to watch. You're going to do a better job, I can tell. Right? Yeah. Rule number one, smile. Smile, 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 smile. There is never enough smiling in your presentation. I forget to smile. And it's terrible that I do, but I forget to smile. Everybody forgets to smile. And when you forget to smile, you look like what? Boring. Boring. Someone who doesn't what? Give a crap about what they're talking about. <laughs> This is really exciting for me to be here today because it's something that I really like to do. Right? Smiling makes all the difference in the world. How many people here are good smilers? Some people are good. How many people forget to smile a lot? I'm going to teach you right now how to make sure you smile in every presentation. That's how you smile. You put a rock in your shoe. I promise you that a pained, uncomfortable smile is better than no smile whatsoever. Sometimes I put it, take a ponytail holder and I twist it really tight around my wrist so I can feel it the entire time. Watch, here's a little piece of plastic. Can I have this? You're not going to use this for anything. I'll put it in my shoe and I'll then remember to smile for the rest of the presentation as long as I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> it works. You are so nervous when you're in front of investors. You're so nervous when you're in front of an audience. You're so nervous when you're in front of people you don't know that you forget to smile. And if you don't smile, people aren't going to think you're excited. And if you're not excited, why would I give you a dime to invest in your company? It's stupid to invest in people who aren't excited about their company. That's why we get a lot of people who have great companies and great ideas that don't smile and don't show passion and don't show excitement and they suck at presenting their ideas and they lose. I mean, it's one thing to have a bad business uh, idea. It's another thing to have a good business idea and give a bad presentation. And it happens all the time. I'll tell you some painful stories in a minute. There are two types of eye contact. There's what I call gentle eye contact and there's direct eye contact. Gentle eye contact, you move your eyes between the person's eyes, back and forth between their eyes, and this little square that is created by this little triangle. That's gentle eye contact. When you're close to someone, you use gentle eye contact. You with me still? Yeah. <laughs> steady eye contact is when you look at their eyes directly and you don't lose gaze. You keep steady eye contact. They're very, very different. <coughs> if you use gentle eye contact with someone, they can't tell you're looking at them from a distance. If you use steady eye contact with somebody close up, it feels very awkward. Awkward, <laughs> awkward right? Yeah, it feels weird. It feels <laughs> aggressive. But back in a distance, does it feel awkward now? No. It feels good because you know that I'm connecting with you. At a distance, steady eye contact is critical. And close up, it's critical to use gentle eye contact. If you use steady eye contact in the wrong place, you're doing the wrong thing. Another thing, 
Eye con broken eye contact is bad too. If I, you ever hear of someone who's shifty eyed? What does shifty eyed mean? They make and break eye contact. They make and break eye contact in a certain way that you probably can't get it. Right now, am I being shifty eyed or not? Uh -huh. I'm being shifty eyed, why? You're quickly making eye contact with multiple people for microseconds. Right. I'm breaking eye contact <laughs> during phrases. We speak in phrases. I say one phrase, then I say another phrase. Then I say another phrase. Then I welcome this guy into the room, and we're going to talk about eye contact, and he's making eye contact. Perfect. It's embarrassing to be late, because he's a no. I was, go ahead. Now I threw off my chi. You hold eye contact one person per phrase, or two phrases. You keep eye contact for a couple of phrases, then you move on to the next person for the next couple of phrases. That way you're making good, gentle eye contact, good, direct eye contact. The other thing that eye contact does is it brings people back into the room with you. If there's someone typing on their computer or not paying attention or anything else, you can use the eye contact to bring them back into the room. You can, you can, be felt, you can feel there's someone looking at you. So if they're chit-chatting or doing whatever, just hold a gaze on them until they come back into the room. <laughs> then they're back into the room. And what happens when they come back in the room? Engaged. They're engaged. And what happens when you have an audience who's fully engaged in your presentation? It's more exciting, right? You want to get excitement in the room. If you don't have excitement, what do you have? Boring. Boring. Painfully boring. So you've got to get that rhythm. Per phrase, eye contact per phrase. Gentle eye contact up close, steady eye contact in the, at a distance. There are three types of hand positions. Your shoulders and your hips make a box. There's inside the box. There's outside the box. And there's fully extended. When I say fully extended, I mean elbows straight. Very few people use fully extended arms in a presentation. It's too bad because they're very useful. What they do instead of using fully extended arms, they use one of those little pointers, little laser pointers, and they hold it close. I've seen guys use the laser pointer like this to point to something on the screen like this. It's ridiculous. Just point to it. Three types of right. So when you're in the intimacy, well, we'll talk about when you use each other. If I'm close to you and I'm doing this, I'm, how does it feel? Uh, <laughs> a little weird, right? <laughs> if I do this, how does it feel? More engaging. Right. Get in the picture? Three types of IR movements. The first one is in the box. Second one is outside the box. And the third one is fully extended arms. Those are the only dance steps you've got to know for arm movements. There are two tones of voice. <clears throat> that you can use during a presentation. The back of the room tone of the voice, which I'm using mostly, and the front of the room voice, which I'm using now. Why would I want to use a quiet voice like this? Contrast. Contrast, what else? Who would I be talking to in what I call my handwriting voice? When you read a handwritten letter, how often do you write a business memo by hand? Zero times. Zero times. How often do you write a thank you note by hand? Once. <laughs> did it once. It was horrible, a horrible experience. Yeah, it's the worst. But you write things by hand that are really intimate and really important to you. So you want to use your handwriting voice. If I was writing a handwriting voice, I wouldn't say, Dear Grandma, thank you very much for the... You don't say it that way. You say, Dear Grandma, thank you very much for the kind gift. Love, Mike. That's your handwriting voice. You want to use your handwriting voice with people who you care about because remember, not everybody in the room is important. So when I'm talking to the back of the room, I want to make sure everyone hears me. When I'm talking in my handwriting voice, I want to make sure the people who matter hear, hear me. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. I love it. That's handwriting voice. Two tones of voice. Two dance steps. You got them now. Those are the only two you need. Back of the room voice and front of the room voice. Handwriting voice. Back of the room voice and handwriting voice. Back of the room and handwriting voice. The position of the body, you can go forward, you can go side to side, you can even go diagonal, but we're not going to talk about it, it's advanced moves. <laughs> I don't want to get anybody confused today. <clears throat> you go back and forth in a room to emphasize a point. The first hand movement is inside the box. The second hand movement is outside the box. The third hand movement is fully extended. My side to side motion allows me to emphasize points as I go through the presentation. Usually you have slides, your slides have, what do your slides have on them? Stop. Information. Information, a lot of bullet points. 
Bullet point one. No, good. A lot, a lot of times I have bullet points. Not all. I, there was a point in my life where I said, I'm never going to have words on a presentation again. And I would only have pictures. It was very difficult to pull off on a regular basis. But they were very cool when I was able to do it. Shh. Not one of our guests. It was? Oh. Yeah, was a we'll get him when she comes back in. So, emphasize side to side. Two kinds of eye contact. My fingers are up, using outside, I'm in my emphasis zone. Two, three, side to side motion is for emphasizing points. Front to back motion, going forward and backwards, are how you want to relate to the audience. If I want to relate in a personal way, I go into my front zone. If I want to relate to you a different way and get more excited, I go back. It helps you relate to the people in the room better. I come out or go back up the aisle around the conference table because I want to connect with people. It helps me connect when I go walk forward. It doesn't help me connect when I go side to side. It helps me convey information. Two dance steps. Relate and where does it emphasize. Forgot my own slide. The new slide. I just put this up. There are three types of slide content. One is called a backdrop. One is called a visual aid, and one is called an information slide. If your slides don't fit into one of these three categories, what can you do? Well, who said that? Right. Make it fit. Like I said before, if you're an awesome presenter and you know it already, you don't have to use this. But if you don't, make it fit into these dance moves. Trying to improvise the moonwalk is not cool. There's one way to do that step. A backdrop, a visual aid, and information. Zone number one is the intimacy zone, where I'm standing right now, intimacy zone. I'm speaking to the judges. I'm speaking to the investors, the people who matter the most. I'm speaking only to them. I'm using my handwriting voice. My hands are inside the box. I'm telling personal stories. One of the reasons I like to give presentations like this is because I want to let down every barrier possible for startup companies to get started. That's why I do this. That's why this is important. Talking to the judges in my handwriting voice about a personal story. The slide creates a backdrop. This guy's in front of a slide. It's just for looks. This slide sets a tone. It's just for looks. It's just to set the tone. What kind of tone does this, does this set? Hopeful. Gotta get it. What? Segment. Segment? Excitement, right. Market segment, women who cross their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of tone does this set? Relaxation. Relaxing. But what am I going to talk about when I'm in this in here? Wine. Wine, vacations, good times, relaxation. It sets the tone. It feels good, right? What about this? Guilt. Guilt. How do I want you to feel right now? Right. When I tell you my story, is it going to be a hard, is, is it going to be about a happy story about me going to the Amusement park, or is it going to be a story about something else? Your backdrop slide when you're in the intimacy zone sets the tone for what you want the emotional stage you want someone to be in. There's a good reason why you would want someone to feel the way they're feeling right now looking at this picture. What about this one? We're going to talk about some money, right? If I'm getting intimate with someone here, I want pe people to think about cash. This is a good picture to show. What about this one? Disco. Pick the slide to reflect what you want the tone of the conversation to be. Zone two is the excitement zone. I'm using my back of the room voice. I'm using steady eye contact. I'm bringing people back into the conversation that have left the conversation to take notes. My hands are outside the box. I'm telling a story about why this company is awesome. The super awesome presentation zone program is your key to connecting with an audience that makes sense. Like I, did I tell you about Tanzania yet? I coached a woman using these techniques to raise money for a bakery in Tanzania from American investors. That's a pretty high hurdle. And the investors had the same reaction. Said, why, would you want to, why would I want to do this? This is crazy. Give you a couple on that. What's my security? A building in Tanzania? But she sparkled. She got excitement. She got people connected. And people were so excited about her and her passion. Like, this woman is not going to fail. She's not going to fail me. She's not going to fail. And she got her money. 
So you can jump some pretty high hurdles if you do it right. You're getting excitement. What are you doing with your mouth? Is this thing help me smile a little more than I was before? <laughs> the slide simply reiterates. It's a, it's a visual aid to what you're talking about. That's what the slides are for at this point. But just to help tell your story. They don't tell your story. No slide tells your story. You tell your story, but slides can help you tell your story. So this guy, here he is again. This is his visual aid. He's talking about doctors and patients and buildings. Here's another one. See a Clicks Fix user. I don't have no I took, a, took this off the internet. I have no idea what it means. But clearly they go to Clicks Clicks Fix, Click Fix. They went out of business because of a hard name to pronounce. And it goes into all these things, and then it comes across and their problem is going to be fixed. This slide is reiterating what I'm talking about. Again, your server goes into the RJ metric server and it pops up on your computer screen. Did anybody not understand what I just said? You got it, because I said it. You got it because you looked at the slide. It reiterates what I'm going to say. That's what a zone two slide is all about. The first thing that happens is you go, the data goes into your server. The second thing that happens, it goes into the RJ metrics machine. And the third thing that happens, it pops up on your computer screen. That's a zone two slide. This is a terrible zone two slide, but it's still a zone two slide. Why is it terrible? It looks like somebody threw up on the slide. But if you can explain this, it's a zone two slide. Or it could be a zone three slide, but we'll get to that, get to that later. Zone three is about information. When you're trying to convey information, what kind of information do you want to convey about your business? How it works. How it works? What else? If you can't tell how it works in a zone two slide, your business is too complicated. That's a good point. What, 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 what kind of information? Business model, how you make money, financial projections, customer analysis, data. Those are information slides. Now we're talking using my speak to the back of the room voice just to the judges. I'm making steady eye contact because I want to make sure they understand. If, if their look turns to confusion, I've got to change my message. I'm using steady eye contact. My arms are fully extended because I'm pointing to data. I'm referring to data. I'm covering up data that I don't want them to look at. I'm talking as very clearly as I can using my back of the room voice. <clears throat> this guy is presenting a very ugly financial statement. He's standing in front of the slide. People always say, don't stand in front of your slide. Why would you want to stand in front of your slide? Why would that be a good thing? Right. Cover up what doesn't matter. We're not talking about year one. We're talking about year two. So don't look at year one. We're not talking about April. We're talking about May. So let's, let's look at May. Cover up points in your slide that don't matter at that point in the, in, the, in the conversation. So here's a guy talking about data on a screen. This is a much better zone three slide because it's much easier to understand. It's still a lot of data, but it's much easier to understand. So as you can see, when you say as you can see, by the way, it's a terrible thing to say during a presentation. I should not have said it. But if you do say it, point out as you can see. Don't do this. As you can see, the contributions equal $56,012 in year four. You see, as you can see, contributions equal $56,012 in year. That's as you can see. This slide tells a story. I can point to these sections. Special events, in-kind donations, grants, contributions. I can touch the screen. My arms are fully extended. It's exciting. You get in this? I know my judges. I'm making good eye contact with them. I can make a communication with them. It only matters that the important people know this information. It doesn't matter that anybody else knows it. It's irrelevant unless they can actually do something for you. So go to the influential people in the room. The judges matter. Concentrate your efforts on the people who matter in the room on slides like this. Here's another great zone three slide. Not a lot of information. 2007, we have $22,400 in revenue. Net income, 4006 or $4,600,000. We took a little dip here. This dip is because we acquired a new building. We can explain this slide very easily using our arms, our tone of voice, our eye contact. I can't describe a financial statement nearly as well than something like this. So work to make your slides with the data on them as detailed as possible without being overwhelming. Tell your story with the slide. This slide has too much or too little data on it? Too much. Unless what? Unless it's not about the data. 
This is, a soft, this is an example of our software screen. Here's where you find our top five influences. Here's where you find key performance indicators. When I'm talking about software, when I'm taking people, walking them through, I can refer to specific points on my screen. So even though this is a confusing slide to look at, if I was standing away from it and talking about it, uh, as you can see, the Activities tab it allows people to access all their activities. As you can see, the Activities tab right there makes a lot of sense for people. How many people saw the Activities tab before I pointed to it? And how many people saw it now? Because I pointed to it. Point to it. No use a laser pointer. Point to the slide. If the slide's over your head, stand up, way up, get a chair. You guys see the uh, Inconvenient Truth with Al Gore? What did he use to point out to his, his, his thing? He used that scissor lift. What was he doing? He was making a point. He had his data going off the screen. That was an information slide. And he was getting right up and personal with it. He was right next to his screen. Whatever you felt about that movie, you can't deny the guy's a pretty good speaker. Maybe you can. You can do whatever you want. It's politics. <laughs> a lot of information on this slide. As you can see, our book value per share is $11.64. <laughs> it's $11.64. Get it? If you're not conveying information this way, you're not conveying information. The next thing you gotta do is you gotta match the zone to the content you're presenting. The love me zone is zone number one. Fall in love with me, make eye contact, refer to a personal story. If you're a man, you wanna to refer to yourself by pointing to yourself. If you're a woman, you wanna to refer to yourself by crossing your hands over your heart. If you do it the other way around, it'll seem kinda of awkward. There are gender differences in how you should present. For instance, when your team member is standing in the back of the room, what should they be doing? <laughs> Smiling. If you're a guy, is that important? The answer is sort of. No one's really looking at you. If you're a woman, however, there's always somebody's eyes on you. I learned this. I had a hunch this was true, and I sat through several rounds of business plan competitions and I watched where the eyes of the judges in the audience were going and if there's a woman standing in the back the frequency that someone looked at them was much 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 higher so if they weren't smiling and they weren't looking engaged they looked like someone who wasn't interested people didn't look at the guys about that much it was very fascinating watch this happen if you're a woman and you're in the back of the room sorry my town sexist but it's true people have their eyes on you no matter what you're wearing or what your hair looks like your eyes are on you even if the man is speaking we should always be, so there's, there's different communication styles you want to have. Little nuances that'll make a difference. If you feel that that shouldn't be the truth, if you feel like you shouldn't have to do that, if you feel that way, that's fine, but you may not raise money because of it. If you're off-putting to somebody, you may not raise money. It's fine to make a stand, but this isn't politics, this is entrepreneurship. The problem, you describe your problem, you get people excited about the problem, zone two. The solution to your problem? You want excitement for that? Do you want excitement for that? Hell yeah, right? The more excitement you can get for the solution, the better. Always in zone two. Always in zone two. When I'm in zone one, I'm connecting with the audience. When I'm in zone two, I'm getting the audience fired up. Zone one is about connecting with individuals. Zone two is about firing people up. How it makes money, who else is doing it, talk about the competition, all zone two. Why w yours will sell it can be done in zone one or zone two. The reason this is going to sell is because we have the best team in the United States. Versus the reason we're going to sell is because we have a competitive advantage. Whatever your message is, if it's intimate reason, make it intimate. If it's a logical reason, make it logical. <clears throat> Why you are the people to make it happen? Your team slide. Question? That's all right. I got only room though. When you introduce your team, you have a unique opportunity to brag about your team, not if you're present introducing yourself. So the CEO should present their whole team and they should brag about them and get people excited. It's shocking how rare this happens, but you should be like, we got Amanda Jenkins. She's the number one Ruby developer in the city of Chicago today and probably the world. 
you can talk about the next person. You get people excited about your people. We got person number one. We got Joe. We got Frank. We got Sally. We got Mark. Get people pumped up about your team, and don't introduce yourselves. Introduce your team so you can brag about them. Um, <clears throat> during some presentations on uh, Thursday, the judges uh, told the presenters um, who didn't introduce themselves or qualify themselves or their team. When do you, if you do at all, introduce yourself and you know brag about your accolades, or do you really just leave it at the team and let them shine? During the presentation, when you presented? Yeah, assuming these people know almost nothing about you. Or is that just not a reasonable assumption? I, this, this is kind of a flow for a presentation. It's important to present the people on your team. Because people need to know you p can pull it off. You can wait till the end. Tell me about yourself, personally. Like, when do I, you know, I'll talk to my team about, but do I at any point say, and this is what I'm all about. This is my, these are my accolades. <clears throat> What you want to do when you talk about yourself is tell your personal story in zone one. I often coach people to come right out to zone one and say, I care about this because I care about people starting companies. I, I believe it's the lifeblood of the United States. I think this is important because without this, people can make a lot of dumb mistakes in presentations. That's when you talk about yourself. I'm not bragging about myself. I'm not telling you my background. I'm telling you something personal about me, why I'm engaged in this. But it was much better for Brian to introduce me today it was for me to introduce myself. Hey, look how great I am. Teach entrepreneurship. It feels weird to brag about yourself. But you can talk much better, you can give a much better introduction if somebody else does it. So yes, making that connection with someone is going to be much more important than their education, their experience. That's where your zone one is for. But can you pull it off is about a zone two excitement slide. How much money you need to ask for the money? You want to ask for the money in zone one or zone two to get people excited? This is the time to, to invest. If you're speaking to a huge crowd of angels that all could invest, you've got to get them excited. If you're speaking to one or two people that are important, you want to connect with them individually. I'll give you a couple of tricks. One's called the laptop monitor trick. The laptop monitor trick works like this. There's a laptop monitor with a remote control like this sitting on a desk that you can see it like that. There's a podium slide driver in the background. Podium slide driver is actually advancing your slides on the big screen. In a lot of cases, you can connect your laptop to the slide machine and have it advance for you. In many cases, it's impossible to do that, especially in a big room, because the podium is where the computer is, right? In the school or the lecture hall is often built into the podium so you can't stand behind the podium and see what you're doing. So you have somebody else drive. So this person looks at the screen. Every time you advance, they advance. So the screen matches what you're saying. Why is this important? Let me rephrase that. Why is this incredibly important? If you keep referencing and looking <clears throat> to your screen, it looks like you're reading off of it and it also looks like you don't know what you're talking about. Right. I can't tell you how many people talk at their screens. Put their back to the audience. You're, you never have your back to the audience. So always be forward. I can walk backwards, walk side to side. I never. I can move all around the room with ever, without ever turning my back on the audience. But a quick glance down at my monitor is a piece of cake. You don't even notice that I'm looking at it. You don't even notice I'm getting those visual cues. If I'm someone who needs visual cues, it's there for me. The University of Chicago and some places I've been in now actually have a monitor screen in front of the speaker, which is something that, that has gone in place over the past few years. I don't know it's because of this. Because when we did it, they didn't have that. Um, and people who do this get a lot of success, success out of it. There's another reason you don't do it. I presented in a business plan competition once. And it was during the transition from uh, Windows uh, PowerPoint 2000 to 2004 or 2003 it was. And the PowerPoint presentation functionality was different in the two generations of the PowerPoint slides. So I did my presentation in 2003. The school's monitor had 2,000 on it. So I had all these fancy builds and things, which I don't use anymore. But they didn't work in the presentation. When the builds came out, when the flybys and everything came out, they did not work. If I had known that, it would have destroyed my presentation. But I was clicking along on my monitor, looking at the slides. They even looked great. Meanwhile, my teammates back here sweating it out, clicking these things, making a mess of the slides. But it didn't matter because I didn't know it. <laughs> so I went along my business talking as if everything was great and I didn't turn around once and afterwards like I, I won that presentation I won the contest 
And afterwards, you're like, gosh, your slides are just not working out very well for you. But I've seen people have a slide not work, and they go, uh, this slide um, isn't working. If this showed up, I've seen other slides where the projector turns the, the blue and the black contrast into one color, so you can't read it. It's extremely common because the bulb's old or whatever, and so people can't see it. If they knew that people couldn't see their slide, they'd be like, oh, well, this actually shows a picture of a frog leaping onto a brick. Like blue frog, black brick. <laughs> Speaker changes. There's always the game show technique. I'm done. Come on down, Tyler. You don't need that. You just switch. You just switch speakers. You just pass off the. Take it. Just pass it off and move away. Now the next speaker can enter and start speaking. Just pass it off and move on. So. The speaker enters zone one. The speaker should always enter zone one. The speaker should always make a connection. The first thing the speaker does is walk right up to the crowd and, you know, thank you very much for having me or make their story, make their point, always coming to zone one. The, the, speaker, the current speaker is leaving from zone two. You never want to leave from zone one because it's awkward because I have a long way to go in this room. If I'm in zone one and I'm talking to the people that matter and then I'm like walking backwards to get rid of my mic, it's just kind of a strange thing. So this current speaker just passes off the remote and floats back into the background. Speaker changes are, should be seamless, and, and you don't need to announce who's who. Sorry, uh, it's kind of a question about the zones again. Uh, so Good, because that's what this presentation is about. Right, so one of those, <laughs> one of those uh, you know, many of those competitions have a, a, really a stage that you're standing on. And uh, it still is organized, let's say, the same way, but the stage is not really close to... to right, uh, stand all the way on the edge of the stage. And you can come down the stairs if you want to. In some cases, the stage, stage, stage you'll have stairs. And you see, uh, a lot of times, the, the, the host of a, like, a, like a television show will come up to the audience and talk to the audience. There's nothing wrong with that. You own that room. Don't let the confines of the room confine you. I mean, I, clearly, I can't walk over this table. I could, I guess, if I wanted to. That'd be a little bizarre. So I can take other advantage of this room. I can come out and talk to people. And I'm answering questions now, so I'm coming towards you. If I was confined by this room, if I didn't change this room, first thing I'd be doing is dodging chairs up here. Second thing I'd be doing is I'd be confined here, and I'd be so boxed in that I'd be doing a presentation like this. So go to the edge of the stage. Use your, you, can, you can use a quiet voice, even if you're on a mic. Answering questions. This is where you lose. This is what causes business plans to lose in front of investors, to lose in front of judges, to lose in front of people, customers. It's the Q&A. The Q&A is where you lose this. I was in a presentation once. This, this is the one that I actually, the contest that I won. And there was a guy there that I thought was sharp. To this day, I think he's a sharper businessman than I am. He's, he's a proven better businessman than I am. And his business plan, I thought, was better. But I remember the moment that he lost this thing. Somebody asked him, so you're, in this, you're going into this new business that your family's been in for years, right? How come they're not investing in this company? And the guy's answer was, oh, they don't want to take the risk. <laughs> he didn't prepare for that question. When I coach teams, they sit down and they write every single possible question they can possibly imagine someone asking, no matter how stupid. They practice and practice and practice. They come up with those questions. And they practice the answer before they go on stage. This, I promise you, for every minute you put into preparing for your presentation, put at least that much time, if not more, into preparing for Q&A. This is where you lose this thing. You can do everything perfect, and then you can lose this. I have a great example on video of a presentation I showed the other day where the team did an excellent job, they, they did a, and they just totally fell apart during Q&A. And it was so heartbreaking because I know they, they knew the answers. They just didn't know how to answer them properly. So when you get asked a question like I just did, you move close to the person. You don't interrupt them. Oftentimes, someone will say, in year three, you said, oh, you, the entrepreneur starts nodding their head. Well, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, I understand what you're going to ask. Just let them ask their question. Let them ask the question. Gentle eye contact with the person. Pause before answering. Give them a beat to collect your thoughts, collect your, what you're going to say. If you don't understand the question, you can rephrase it. Carefully rephrase it act kindly, and if you don't know the answer, you can say, I don't know, but I can look into that for you. It's an acceptable answer. I don't know, but I can look into that for you is an acceptable answer. 
the team that I have in that video spent the whole time answering a question they didn't know the answer to? I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. Now, you should know the answer to that question. I raised about $5 million for a company a few years ago. And everybody we talked to invested, everybody, except for one, because they asked me a stupid question I didn't know the answer of. How much is a single customer worth? I should know the answer to that question, but I didn't off the top of my head. <clears throat> we get the money anyway. Any one from the team can answer. Did anybody hear what I just said? What did I just say? What did I really say? Team needs to know here. Any one from the team can answer. One person can answer the question. Not six, not two. Any one person can answer the question. Unless that person has totally lost your, has an, no idea what they're talking about, which they should, never chime in on someone or talk over someone's answer. What Joe is trying to say is, no, nope, Joe said it, shut up, move on. <laughs> We're talking about a situation that you're in that's not the last conversation. It should be the first conversation. What if Joe was wrong? I mean, shut he up. Shouldn't he shouldn't have been wrong, but he shut have up. But he was. You don't correct him. Okay. Unless he just blew it. But in that case, you blew it. Who cares if he's wrong? I mean, that's where the discipline comes in. Because you're like, oh, Joe just blew it for us. Well, he blew it for you, so he blew it for you. So walk out of the room, keep your head high. Don't argue with your teammate in front of the judges. Don't contradict what your teammate said in front of the judges. That's as bad as saying the wrong thing because they're not paying attention to what he's saying anyway. Most of what you're going to remember about the presentation is how exciting it was and moving around and the basic concepts. You don't remember what people, the questions were. So don't take the question too seriously, but take the person seriously. Can I piggyback on that? You might know Joe made a catastrophic blunder and completely screwed it. Well, it's just like, you know, I was talking about an improv yesterday. The audience doesn't know you made a mistake unless you indicate it. Right. And if they call you on it later on and say, well, you know, I didn't say that right. <laughs> I said $100 million, but I didn't say it right. What I meant to say was $100. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to be there. But the point of the presentation is to get to the next presentation, to the next conversation. You don't have to answer everything perfectly. If you say this, you're admitting you don't know, but you're kind of setting yourself up for another conversation. If you try to answer a question that you don't know the answer to, you're kind of screwing yourself because you look stupid. And you will look stupid. I was in a business plan presentation once where uh, I was coaching a woman. She told me about this situation. I wasn't actually in the room when this happened, but I have verified proof that it did happen. Her business was a cosmetic chain in Russia. And she was presenting the business plan in London. And one of the judges or one of the investors says, yeah, but aren't Russian women kind of dowdy and fat and not very attractive? Why would they want this? And she, he was absolutely dead serious because the image back, you know, 10 years ago, as we were, they were emerging from the Cold War, was the babushka, whatever, that, that was the Russian image. Now, this particular woman was beautiful. She was dynamic. She was well-kept. She, she was smart. She was intelligent. She was well-educated. She had everything that she was trying to cater to, as did many Russian women. But that was a big insult to her nationality. It was a big insult to her. So what's the right way to answer a question like this? There's a perception because of media that women in Russia don't take care of themselves like they do in America. But that's not true. And because that's not true, and because we recognize it's not true, this business will flourish as a result. Because we understand that insight better than anybody else outside of the country does. If countries knew that Russian women took good, such good care of themselves, they'd be all over us with cosmetic. Because, but they're not, so they're keeping the competition out. That's a really good answer to a really, really hard question. It doesn't matter if they insult you. It doesn't matter if anything else. Investors like to talk. They like to have their egos spread around. They like to feel like they're in charge. They like to try to trip you up. They like to be assholes. They like to do all those things because they can. And as nice as they may be at the end of the day, they're going to do that. And your job is just to take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. You can start arguing with them after you get the check. <laughs> get the check, start the argument. Thank you very much. Check cleared. And let me tell you a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Responding to positive concepts, co comments is very much the same. Don't use the comment as a springboard to go off on tangents. I really like what you said about baseball players. Thank you. Instead of, thank you, because baseball is really important to us. And one of the things about baseball is you're just going to dig yourself a hole. I call them rabbit holes. Don't get into it. Don't get into the 
don't get into it with people. Just let the, com the, the comment be the compliment. And people have a hard time doing this interpersonally, too. I'm sorry I called you a jerk. Well, that's fine, because I really thought you, were, you called me. Don't get into it. Just say, I'm, I accept your apology and go on. Is there some sort of overarching guideline for how long the answer should be? It's clearly short, don't get caught into rabbit hole. But sometimes questions get complicated, and I won't complicate that question any further. Right. You're doing exactly what you, you just caught yourself, right? If it's, a comp if it's a positive comment, you don't need any answer to it, except for thank you very much. I appreciate you noticing that. If it's a question, you should have rehearsed this question before you got to this, to this stage. It's, if you have not rehearsed, things are going over your head. They're going fast. You're trying to get a lot of information out. And so you don't know the answer to that question. So keep it short. Keep it simple. Answer the question. Answer the question they're asking. It's very common they wouldn't answer the question. I noticed in year two, you had revenues of $25,000, but no expenses against that. Well, let me tell you about our expense structure. You're not talking to ask about the revenues, you're talking about expenses. It may be relevant to the answer, but you've got to pre-can that. Negative comments, exactly the same way. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for, your input. Thank you for noticing that. I, I think that your whole premise is totally stupid and that you're never going to make it as an entrepreneur. I appreciate your advice on that. That's a good thing to know, because if I didn't know that, I might needlessly continue on with my life. <laughs> <laughs> never, ever, ever argue with people. I've seen this time and time again. They're going to get into an argument with the investor. That's never, ever, ever going to raise you any money, so don't do it. You might have a fleeting chance that that person hates you that you might get asked back again. Didn't like your business plan so much, but you were awesome. And I want to invite you back in. That's how I raised my first million was, I didn't like your presentation so much, but I thought you and your team looked pretty solid, so why don't you come back and talk to us again? That's literally what the guy said. He said, I, he said one of the reasons I like this is because if you guys fail, I had the best little consulting team I could ever want. And you can hire all at once. So that's the Mike Moyer Super Awesome Presentation Zone Program. Three zones, three different purposes, a lot of dance steps. You can choreograph what you're doing for your presentation. So today, when you're doing your own presentations and your own practice, use these techniques. If you don't use those techniques and you aren't an excellent presenter anyway, there's a good chance you're going to hide your idea under a boring presentation. Thank you for coming.